She read this prophecy Wednesday night. I want to read it to you again. He spoke this last Sunday to us. Now if you don't take these prophecies to heart and apply them to you, then you've missed the mark. They're, they're obsolete to you, but I believe those hearing, those watching, the title to this one is Know Your Significance. The Lord said in four paragraphs here, He said, I have birthed you for a sole purpose, and yet you hardly know your significance. Do not let your flesh or the mundane blind you. Let's just pause right there. You're doing real good in worship. But let's just pray. Because when he spoke that first line there again to us, the Lord said, you're still blind. Overall, all of us are still blind to his glory. Father, in the name of Jesus, open up our eyes this morning. Father, let the intercession that has been taking place and the prayers of the saints open our eyes. Father, I pray that the mundane and everything that is around us to compete, the flesh is in competition with our spirits this morning to abate and hold back us going into that place of who we are, of the kings and priests in the earth to walk out of this place and absolutely launch a miracles everywhere we go. Father, I cry out to you and everyone else in this place with the same heart. We cry out to you in the name of Jesus and those that are watching. Open our eyes, Father. Let us walk through this sphere, this place, this, this barrier that has had us so long in a place where we did not even realize how close we were, but yet how far we were. Jesus Cause us, I pray, to realize like never before our significance in you. What you've called us, to, called us to do, Lord, we worship you and we praise you. He said this would be the answer of the heart or this would be the struggle. I know me. I know me, saith self unto you, yourself. I know me, I'm just me. But I say unto you that you're my son, my daughter, my high priest, that is to bring forth the high praises and the intercession in the earth that will bring forth the great and last day harvest of my kingdom, saith the Spirit of grace. We'll just pause right there and pray. Father, I know this as a well-studied historian on Revival history. I know that there has never since the day of Pentecost till the present ever been a revival that has ever taken place that has not had the groundwork, the grassroots, the beginning of it all was prayer. Men and women who began in prayer and began to intercede and began to call on God until, Lord, the heavens were fat with glory and their lives were changed and a presence came in an atmosphere I'm praying God for the encouragement for these intercessors Lord for these men and women for whoever has a burden of prayer upon their life right now father I pray that you'll shield their lives against any distractions and onslaughts of hell those men and women that are in that are pregnant with this birthing process Lord I pray that in Jesus name those that are watching that are part of this outpouring to be those that are pregnant in their spirits and something growing inside of them 
Father, it will only be through their intercession and through their asking, their continual prayers of intercession in the Spirit that this thing is birthed. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I stand on this planet bearing witness by the Holy Ghost and with angels in this service and with angels there with those that are watching. Let us birth this thing. Father, I pray that this thing will be birthed in the earth. That the atmosphere that you have so desired for many generations help us to get past our flesh. Help us to get past indifferences. Help us to get past what we cannot even see today. I do not know, no, I do not know how to pray as I ought. I don't even know how to begin to approach this in myself. But one makes intercession with groanings that cannot be articulated through my mind. Father, I pray. I pray God bless the intercessors. I pray that they will know their value, not with arrogance. And of course, that's a, almost an unnecessary a prayer because a true intercessor has forsaken pride. A true intercessor is not bound by pride. Their heart is only on you, Lord, and for the work that you've called them to do. I pray for them. I pray first for them. They're the firebrands, the, fire the kindling that will bring this all about. For he said, for you've not expected more of yourself as you should, but expect far more of yourself in going forward. Put a higher mark on your life and expect yourself to be in a place with me that can turn the city and, can, and that can turn the nation, saith the Spirit of grace. When you think of smaller terms of yourself, you minimize my ability to flow through you in authority and expectation of things in faith that will truly turn the city upside down, saith the Spirit of the Lord. When you relate to yourself as you would relate to a friend with many faults and do not see the higher part of you which is called up into higher places to make intercession for the city. When you live out of the familiar and when you de uh, then you demoralize and bring low the place of authority that is in you that I've placed to bring forth the revival, saith the Spirit of grace. There is a pride that can't exist out of the flesh, but too many guard themselves at the expense of the Spirit, saying, I will not pride myself over there. But yet in the same way, you'll not live out of that place of authority by familiarizing yourself with the flesh. But you must, you must come up higher, expect more and do more and be more for me. For that is the place of authority, saith the Spirit of grace. Father, I worship you. I glorify you and we worship you. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We lay this at your feet, Jesus. We lay this commission that you've given us at your feet, a crown, Lord, that you've given us to wear in this life and yet we cannot wear it except that you place it there on us daily through prayers and intercession. And so, Lord, not with arrogance, but with everything that you're telling us in these prophecies, bear, bearing witness with the word of God, we proceed forth as kings and priests. And we worship you, Jesus. Amakali is in revival, the place of wherever these that are watching, that they're claiming that territory that is in revival. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians, please, if you will. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This is a familiar portion of Scripture. And I uh, just want to read these verses just so you'll see it out of your Bible. We get a time to share this morning in giving. This is the foundation. This verse right here is the foundation for all New Testament giving. If, you, if somebody said, 
what's share with me and ask ask you uh, what's a what's the foundation for all New Testament giving? This is it right here. It's in Second Corinthians chapter eight, and it's in verse nine. And Paul said to the Corinthian church, he said, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Amen. That's it. We know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. What grace? The grace that though he was rich, yet he became poor, that I threw his poverty and all, the, the offshoot of that, I mean the fruit, the outside fruit, is that, and it, it's preached this way, and it's, it's kind of right, but it's not totally, that he was living in opulence, and that's right, because if you go to the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, you look at that city that we're going to live in one day, and that city comes down, I got a sermon coming on that. It's going to be good. Actually, that's a, the city looks like a Rubik's Cube. It's amazing. It's 1,500 miles in every direction. But it comes down, and, uh, but there'll be an earth along. The city probably won't set on the earth, but anyway. But that city is coming. But if you see that city, and you look at the riches of it, and you read about the riches of that city in the last two chapters of Revelation, you, you think, wow, God does come from a, Jesus really did come from a place of, opulence. So that argument can be made. But the truth is this, the essence of it is, though he was rich spiritually, and though he was uh, born spiritually alive, yet he became poor. He became totally impoverished. God's love for mankind was totally, totally exhausted the day that Jesus gave his life. He became absolutely destitute, impoverished, being separated from the life of God that he was, that he had, to actually go into the lake of fire and to be destroyed or to, for that man uh, to burn there and to suffer for us. He became impoverished that I through his poverty might become rich first and foremost, first and foremost that I might be born again. His poverty interpreted over to my spiritual riches. That's the, that's the, first, the first thing. But because Paul is talking about finances here, it's very applicable to say his impoverishment became my riches. In other words, through him, not only do I spiritually can prosper, but then every phase of my life, Jesus said, I came, John 10, the thief cometh to steal, kill, and destroy. It's really wonderful. He just drew a line in the sand. He basically said, he's over there, I'm over here. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come to give you life. That word is zoe. It's the word of, it's the God kind of life. It's the essence of everything, God living in everything, your body, your finances, and everything. And that's what Jesus came to do. So when he came to prosper us, that we might become, he was poor, that we, through his poverty, might be rich, it interprets out to everything. Well, it interprets out to your blessing, your financial blessings as well. And that's where our giving comes in effect, into effect because we know that if we're blessed, then we can also bless. If we're blessed, we can also bless. So then the next chapter gives that same description in chapter 9, verse 8. And it says, and God, because it's, these two chapters are all about the gift and giving. And because of that foundation that he was rich and became poor, that his, his poverty interprets out to my riches. Verse not 8 of chapter 9 says, And God is able to make all grace, the same grace that Jesus walked in, abound towards you, that ye, now it's very descriptive, very descriptive, that ye always, everybody say always. always. And then it says all, always having all. Everybody say having all. having all. So it says always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work, or you might say in all things or at all times. Actually, the word things is italicized there because it's not there, but it says in all, so it's saying in every occasion, if the grace that the Lord uh, provided works in you, 
then you'll have the disposition of New Testament giving, which is, I'm blessed, so therefore I will be a blessing. And I will expect that that blessing is upon me at all times for every good work. So that at any time that he's speaking to me or on a deliberate basis, a deliberate giver. So a, a disposition of a giver is like, I got to give. I got to give. Not because somebody's manipulating me. I just, I got to give. It's like the heart of a, a prayer person. It's like, I'm just going to die if you don't give me a place to pray. If you, if, don't do anything, take anything from me, but don't take my prayer life. That's the heart of an intercessor. And that's the heart of people that, that I believe he was speaking to a while ago. And that's the heart of many of you. Alan Taylor said something the other day. I was listening to him. He said, uh, a person said to him way back years ago, said, uh, you know, I just want to pray more. I just, I got to, and I guess he was trying to find the time. And <laughs> it was back in Bible college days. And, and I guess this guy, he had a, a he had a, a Beamer. He had a BMW. And he was, I guess, trying to go to, through Bible college. And he said, I just need to, I want to pray more. I want to pray more. Alan said, if you want to pray more, you, you may have to sell that car. And get another one and get something more affordable so you're not having to work all the hours to make those payments. If put your money where your mouth is, in essence, you remember how Dave used to say, if you had to, you may have to cut off a room in the house. He wasn't talking about literally cut. He was saying, you, if necessary to complete your assignment, you may have to take less, at least for a time. And uh, so Alan said, you know, that's. A challenge for a lot of people because when you then you say that it's like uh, then they they hide oftentimes you know the flesh will hide behind the anonymity of uh, it'll anonymously hide behind um, responsibility once obligated like well I've got this thing now so I've I've got to work. So, I can't put all the prayer hours in. Well, <laughs> you can if you downsize. The, you know, the flesh also. Now, this doesn't hurt. This, uh, this isn't an ouch to givers because givers live like this. You, if you're a giver and you're living out of the abundance of his grace in your life and you're under the directive of I'm, I'm a supply unto every good work, and I'm listening to him. Then you live like this. Just because you can doesn't mean you can. And just because you can't doesn't mean you can't. What is that all about? Well, just because you've got a plenty to do that doesn't mean you can do that. Because you're listening to him. And just because it's not there, if you can't, and it doesn't look like you can't, then if he said do it, he's going to supply it. Amen. You can. Amen. He's going to give that to you. And you, can, you can do it. The same way the, the flesh will find a way to wiggle out of prayer. It's sometimes, without knowing, it'll wiggle out of the place of giving as well. It's like, well, pastor, you've taught us for years. You don't want our lunch money? Absolutely not. Well, you don't want our Christmas money? No, absolutely not. But you know the last thing that a, the, uh, the first thing that a, a prayer person does or, or a person that's a true giver, before they sign on the dotted line to make those extra payments or buy that or do that, they think, wait a minute. Because this is how the world thinks, or the, how that those that are less, church giving, offerings, those kinds of things, that's, that, can be, that, that can be down here at the bottom. That can be sacrificed. See, if my giving, and then the flesh will feel like, well, I've obligated to myself. I've, I've obligated this. I bought this. Now I've got to pay for it. Yeah, you sure do. Because you've taught us, Pastor. You've taught us. Be responsible. That's right. But here, here's the thing. True givers 
before they do anything, they'll say, wait a minute, if this affects my giving, I can't do it. If this takes one dime away from what he's told me to do, I can't do it. Until he brings it in, then I can go forward. Does that make sense? And that's not law, that's the law of the heart. That's the heart of a true giver. Hallelujah. And we haven't even got into the message this morning, <laughs> praise God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for those that are watching. And we thank you for those that are part of this ministry and giving and those that are part of knowing that you're the one that gives to us so that we can be a part of every good work. And Lord, you meet all the needs at the house, the home. Lord, you're first about meeting our needs. And then through that, Lord, you supply unto every good work. And Lord, we just love you. We just thank you. We thank you for the awesome blessings that you provide in our life. To provide a blessing, Lord, to the ministries that you've called us to give to. We bless you this morning. We thank you for those that are giving online this morning. And we thank you for this offering in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Let's all stand together. We're going to... Uh, minister to you this morning a little bit about running with an attitude and I think there's an attitude around here about a decisiveness of where we're going. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. Glory, glory, glory. Can somebody say glory? glory. It did real good. Now we're leading up, we're, we're not teaching out of Hebrews, we've taught out of Hebrews a lot but we're not teaching the contextual value of Hebrews uh, this morning, but I'll just tell you chapter 11 is the so-called faith chapter. It's all a hallmark of Old Testament uh, people, and this book of Hebrews was written to Hebrews, to Jewish people. So the writer is using all of the Old Testament people as an example for him to say, look at them as an example for your future and for who you are. And so what I'm saying is this, in chapter 11, if you're familiar with it, he's just named a bunch of names, you know, like Abraham and Moses and David, and he's given a lot of quick synopsis stories of how wonderful these people were in their stand of faith. But looking at verse 1 in chapter 12, it's a continuation of the same thought. And he says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Well, when he says that, he's saying not that they're standing like in heaven. I've heard it preached like, oh, they're in a grandstand of heaven and they're watching us. They can't see us. That's, that's totally contextually wrong. He's led up to say this. He's saying this. Because we've got all these witnesses, like it, just like you've heard in court. Like, if I'm the defense attorney and I've brought forth, it's been eight days of defense. Uh, I've been bringing forth witnesses, and I've had this witness and this witness come on the stand, and I'm I'm concluding my case, and I'm saying because of all uh, jury, you know, I'm speaking to the jury, and we're the jury because of all these witnesses. This is what we're going to conclude. So this is what he's saying. Because we're compassed about with all these testimonies that I just gave you, this is what we're going to see. Let us lay aside, this is his instruction, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience. That's the word hufamine. Homer loves that word so much. It's the word consistency. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, when he says, let us lay aside every weight and sin, we're not going to major on sin this morning. We've majored on sin a lot of times. Sin, of course, is those things uh, that can be right up to the killer sins. You know, there's, there's the things that, that, and we've listed all those things, that if you deliberately do them long enough, you will die. You will spiritually die. Uh, and uh, the... the the, more, the faster you do them and the more often you do them, your ticker tape is going to, it's going to diminish. It's going to run real, your little candle that's inside of you, that's a flame of fire. Uh, the longer you stay in adultery, it won't take long. 
it'll be, you know, an adulterer, first of all, uh, you, as soon as you're born again, that should be cast out. That, that, that puppy should go real quick. But, uh, well, I, you know, I've had a problem with fornication consistently for the last 10 years, but I'm born again. Sir, ma'am, you, please, you're, you're not born again. Okay, you're like, you don't have the candle on the inside of you. It, it went out, if you ever were. But I can tell you how to get born again. Hallelujah. Hmm, I want a rabbit trail so bad. <laughs> I want a rabbit trail so bad. Well, they were living together for 40 years. I'd had to do it. And they had 10 children, but they, they, they were, they, they were, they had a common, what do they call them? Common marriage? Common law marriage. No, they were just shacking together for 40 years. And if in their last breath they didn't say, Jesus, forgive me. Marriage scripturally is, it's done in different ways around the world, but it has to be the consummation of legal, you have to legally, legally, because then you're disobeying the law. You have to, le then you have to have a consummation of witnesses witnessing before heaven and earth that you have joined yourself, and almost in all nations it's done from someone with spiritual authority. Do you know God, uh, God recognizes marriage even if the people aren't born again. God, you know, God will recognize, two people get legally, born, two people get legally married in that sense of the word, even if they're not born again, that, that union is sanctified in marriage because God recognizes that because it's legally done. I said I couldn't. I wouldn't. Oh, Jesus. Y'all are supposed to be helping me. So you're supposed to say, reel it in, reel it in. Okay. Okay. But the weight, we're going to try to stay away from the sin part. But the weight, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our salvation, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Folks, we've got a joy set in front of us. It's heaven, but it's going to be all them little kids and all the people that are born again, spirit-filled, baptized in the Holy Ghost. And we're just going to have a ball. We're just going to have a fun time with a lot of persecution. Jesus said, you'll have all these things. Don't give me that preposition. Don't give me the with. Oh, stay away. With persecution. I knew you were going to say it, Jesus. You're going to have all this with the preposition of with persecution. Okay, but the joy of the Lord is going to be our strength. Hallelujah. The joy of the Lord. He said, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our, our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and was set down at the right hand of the, right hand of the throne of God. Now the word wait, onkos, onkos, it's onkos, onkos, and it simply means, that's what we want to focus on for just a moment, Ong, O-N-G, ong kos, ong kos, it means a mass, it means a bending, it means a bulging, okay, <laughs> a bulging by its load, and it's not physical, I'm just kidding, it means, i.e., a burden, just a burden, it's not even necessarily something that'll send you to hell, in fact, he makes a distinction here between sin and weight. I put down here, and I know this is agreed with by those that are watching and those that are in here that are revivalists, it's time to get rid of the final weights to run the perfect race. Let's, just go, let's go ahead and get it done. Our present instruction is to run into the fire of purging. That is something that you'll hear I'm not making these, pro these prophecies up. I'm just praying and God keeps saying all this stuff to us. And if you tune in Gary Carpenter and if you tune in Jim Martin and if you tune in Alan Taylor, you're hearing us all say the same thing and we're not even getting together and comparing the notes. It's go in. We're saying it different ways. But it's all the same thing. Go into these final... I heard Jim say this past week, and he didn't apologize for it. And it's usually like... Usually if you take the connotation like, oh, we're faith people, let's not... And I understood that... He said, I'm sick and tired of not having power. And I'm sick and tired of you not having power too. I said, well, thank you very much. 
But I want, like Gary texted me yesterday, he goes, I want to, he said, I sent this to Jim. I want to belong to that sick and tired of not having any power club. Amen? Because that's where we're at. Our present instruction is to run into the fire of purging. Not hold back, but run into it. Our running right now is not running out to do the works, but running into the fire so that the works can be done in us. Now, there's a big difference. This is not a hurry up and wait, but this is hurry up and get into the purging. Why? Because this is translucent. Uh, it's transparent. In other words, the translucence of it is this. I can see through this. What can you see? I can see on the other side of purging is, is the outpouring and is the turning loose. But when you get real gung-ho, we can do it now. Let's do it now. Let's go. Let's go. You're going to get a lot of people that, boy, and that's why I would encourage you, listen to the messages Gary's doing right now and Jim and Alan because it's a perfect synchronization between where we're going and turning the church loose not holding anybody back, but the necessity to take us to a full grown-up position so that we can be totally trusted with this revival. Because most groups, and I, I tell you, I have read, I am a historian on church revivals. They have all burned out because of defaults in the leadership. Things that would not get purged or grown up and go through the fire... And because there was like, we can do it, let's win them, let's go, let's start this, let's start that. And they, they went full, full forward. I guarantee the message that we're hearing now had to preface them just like it pref it's prefacing us. But if you circumvent this, and then if you keep calling on God for power, he's going to give you as much as he can, and you'll interpret it as a revival. And then Dave used to say, one, miracles will come. You'll, you'll be visited with miracles. Then you've got another visitation. Here he comes. You can see him coming down the road. And he's Mr. Destruction of Reasonings. He's Mr. Destruction of Property. He's Mr. Destruction of This. And if you've not gone through the fire to get to where you're supposed to be, if you've circumvented it and taken an artificial authority, and yet there will be miracles taking place, he's going to come. He's going to inspect you. And if there's any of that hidden, I know this about me, but nobody else knows this about me. If they knew this about me. See, Dave said revival takes place when the real you that is at home, that is, lives at home, <laughs> when it comes to church, that's when revival takes place. When the real you can live in church and be you and not put on anything else, but who you are. That's where revival's at. When Satan can't, when he can just do this, try to comb through you, and there's nothing that he can touch, you're a walking place for miracles to, to, to flow through you. And then Jesus will turn up the volume, the thermostat, to where that all those things because if you've got any, if, if you've got a little bit of like, mm, yeah, I did, yeah. Yeah, I got that blind eye. Yeah, thank you very much. I, no, don't brag on me. Don't brag on me. But you're like, I did it. Yeah, these hands did it. And you wouldn't say nothing like that. But if there's anything that when you lay down like, man, I'm a hot rod. I'm pretty cool. I am. I finally got it. I finally got it. He's like, oh, I'm setting him up. <laughs> I'm just putting him on a tee, and I'm going to dry. I'm going to wait. Let him get a couple more miracles under their belt. And then I'm going to drive it home. And he'll find something. And pride will eat you up like a green gourd. It'll just tear the heart right out of you. Hallelujah. We are not in a hurry up and wait mode, but rather a hurry up and complete the purging process. 
The instruction for the fire of purging is transparent. I said that. It's translucent. I like that because it's not like he's letting us see, like, I'm not telling you hurry up and wait. I'm telling you hurry up and go through this because on the other side of it, can you see through this fire? I can see through it, Father. The other side of it is the outpouring. It's revival. It's trust. He trusts us to do. God is uh, gearing us up for the final purpose. Weights that easily beset. Let me talk about that for a moment. Why do they easily beset us? Because we cannot see them. We're frustrated that we have not seen the outpouring, and yet the weights have beset us without our knowledge. Our own, only Jesus is our author, as the Word said, He's the author and the finisher. Only Jesus is our prototype for our assignment. There is no other prototype for what we are looking for to accomplish this. Uh, I, I'm not saying that every church and every ministry is called to revival. That's their main call. I'm not saying that, okay? I don't believe that. Some are called to different things. Uh, maybe to feed the poor and to uh, education and those kinds of things because we need all that. What I am saying, what I can believe is that every pastor should pray and every pastor should fast, no matter what their call is. But we know what our call is. We know what our call is. So for our call, now if, if our call was feed the poor, there's some good places that feed the poor like crazy. I'd go study under them. And I'd walk around with their person of logistics and say, how did you do this? And how do you, if it was education and for us to start a Christian school here, I'd go to people, there are prototypes in the earth for that and people that are doing, but there's no prototype. There's some people that are after what we're after, but there's no prototype that's got there yet. That's got a university on miracles. Like we do this and we were getting 50, 60, 70% all the time. I would go, <laughs> I'd spend when I wasn't here in this pulpit, I'd be up at their, wherever their place is, and I'd follow that guy around. And eventually, he'd talk to me. But there's no prototype. The only prototype we've got present tense is the author and the finisher of our salvation, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's all we can see. And we know where we're going, and we know how to get there, and we know that this fire is the next step. What fire? The fire of purging. Going all the way in. Well, how does that get logistically? Let's get it down. Let's get it. Uh, Dave used to, Dave would say, let's just throw theory out. Let's get right down to hardcore, you know, the brass tacks, brass tacks. Okay. Praying in tongues and fasting. Going into God. Spending time brings forth the purging. Well, I'm going to fast my ball games, Pastor. From Genesis, I'm going to fast my shopping. I'm going to fast uh, my recreation. My, I'll tell you what I'm going to fast. I, I pr listen, y'all. This next year, I'm going to give up golf for a full year. <laughs> for a full year. I've never played around. <laughs> probably never will. <laughs> From Genesis to Revelation, not one scripture contextually or in the Hebrew or the Greek can you find anything close that fasting has anything to do with anything other than food. Can you say food? Well, I know, Pastor, that... No, you don't know. You don't know. <laughs> you can't show me a scripture. Well, I can... I think I can. <laughs> That's what you thought. <laughs> it's, all, it's fasting, prayer, going into God. Well, I'm going to do that sometime this year. <laughs> Listen, if you're not already contemplating and thinking, like when the, your next is, you probably won't. <coughs> you probably won't. I'm trying to be nice. Probably it's not a... So Dave would say, it's through prayer. It's not the theory. It's, let's, somebody tell me how to walk. You know, people, the, the preachers will tell you, you've got to walk in more love. Well, that's fine. I knew that before I came in. I knew that. I, wow. wow. 
How do I walk in love? Corre que esteda borruquere este te diti ator. On and on and on. The purging, the purging, the purging. The pur when work in it. Uh, be like I said Wednesday night. Be like Nehemiah's builders. Nehemiah builders, if you read them, they were masons. They were, you know, they would put mud on the wall with a trial. And it said they had their, their trial in one hand and they had their sword or spear in the other. Because the Amorites and the Moabites, Tobiah and whatever that other guy was, they were out there causing an insurrection and there were going to be like thousands of these other countries while the wall was still being built to try to get in there and invade and they worked and they guarded. They were ready to fight at all times. So we've got to be ambidextrous in the and ready to, willing to fight, willing to worship, pray fast, and, and at the same time speak the word and say, we're not going to let this happen. We're not going to let this die. We're going to keep going. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen. Appreciate those amens. Uh, our present instruction. God is gearing us up for the final purpose. Um, as I said, the reason why that weights beset us is because we don't see them. We don't understand that they are. And only, Je only Jesus is our, listen, he's our only prototype. And we've got to strip off to bare bones to get this thing done. Strip off, I mean, all the weight, whatever is there. And I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about everything, attitudes, aspirations. Well, if they'd let me speak, I'd, <laughs> they'd really know, you know. Or if, if, if they would have just acknowledged me or, man, or this, that, and the other, or, uh, you know, on and on and on, or jealousy, uh, uh, just all kinds of stuff. All kinds of, and fear and worry. Somebody said, well, I'm owning this. I don't, you're not supposed to own anything. Like, I'm worried about this. All your worry doesn't produce anything. Not one moment of your worry produces anything. And worry, I'll tell you, worry, I don't care if you think you're being responsible, worry's a sin. Because you're not casting your care on him. Well, I'm a very responsible person. Kenneth Hagin said, I came, he said, my mama was the best worrier. My grandma was the best worrier. He said, they taught me, he said, I was one of the best worriers that has ever been. He said, I came from a grandma and, grand and a mother that were the best worriers. Warriors, he said, I had, that thing had to go. It had to be broken. Worry is sin. He teaches us to cast all our care on him. You're not going to cause a revival in worry. Well, how do I do it? Prayer and speaking. Somebody said, well, I don't know how to do it. Listen, we try. We got those racks back there. They're, they're, there's uh, financial confessions. And there's healing confessions. You won't get up in the morning. You may be a professional worrier. And you may worry about your finances. You won't get up in the morning and go through those things. And then take them like pills every day. Three or four or five times a day if necessary. And you speak those things, speak those things, speak those things. It only take you about five minutes to go through. And you speak those scriptures. And along with the scripture, there is a confession. You won't do that. That eventually, you'll find that you lost worry and you don't know how it went away. Amen. But I'll tell you if, you, if you're worry or if you're sick and you don't confess the word. And you just stay worried and sick. I can't help you. And he can't help you. And, and really, you're actually in rebellion. You're just like, I know, I know what he says. But I, I've been this way so long. Uh, <laughs> well, nobody can help you. You got to help yourself. Okay. I didn't get many amens on that. I, you guys need to say amen. 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 Praise God. Now, this is the year we need to uh, perfect our blueprint. Now, blueprints are... The thing that God has said to you, uh, the group that went with us heard Tim at the conference talk a lot about blueprint. That's not, you say, well, where's it in the Bible? It's your vision. It's your vision. That's where it's at. Without a vision, the people, what is your vision? Can you, what is your vision? 
And it doesn't have, you need, to, you need to write that down. And it doesn't have to be a book. It may be just one line, one or two lines. But you need to know what he said to you. Well, I don't know what he said to me. You mean to tell me you know, if you're born again, and if you're spirit-filled, especially being able to pray, somewhere in your life, there's a quiet place where you, you can hear his voice. You should be able to hear his voice. Or if you say, I don't think I can hear his voice. Well, what, what's in your heart? That's his voice. What's in your heart? I, well, I'd like to, I know what I'd like to do, Pastor. I, I'd like to be a part of doing this for the kingdom. And listen, here's the thing. If it, if it sounds like it's doable, if it's, well, I'll put it this way. If it sounds like there's no way for it to be accomplished, it's probably from God. <laughs> Only the unaccomplishable no way possible. Only those things are really from God. Because he's going to give you something that is so wonderful that you're going to say, that's not me. I, I could never do that. I, I don't know how I could do that. I don't know how that would. But he's telling you that because it's going to fit right into this revival along with you also laying your hands on the sick and raising the dead and everything else. Hallelujah. And don't give up on anything. I mean, anything. This is not a year to give up. Listen, there are women out there, and there's women in here, and there's women out there that are ready to conceive. I'm talking about physically to have babies. You need to continue to believe that, receive that. There are people that have visions in their life that they've said, I know God said this to me, but I just, I'm not seeing the natural signs of it. This is a year, this is a time for every single one of us to strip off and say, we're going into the fire because on the other side of it is all the miracles that we're believing God for. These things are going to happen and they will happen. Hallelujah. Let me just read this to you. Well, no. You turn there because you're close. It's, it's right there in Hebrews. Hebrews 11. You're still in Hebrews, hopefully. You were in 12. But Hebrews eleven seventeen says this. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, he offered up Isaac that had received the promises. Uh, he... And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Now, everybody say figure. figure. Now, you can look up. But you've heard me minister to this, minister on this before, so I don't have to minister long on it, but I will reaccount this for you because this is one of our key ingredients to understanding that what we, where we're at is not what is going to be. And we've got to see this in a figure. The word figure there is the word parabola. The word parabola in the Greek is the word parable. It's the same word where it always says in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Jesus gave a parable. And you've heard me talk about this, that Abraham, he received Isaac in a parable. Received him what? If you read that whole story, he received him back from the dead. It was a three-day journey from where Abraham lived to Mount Moriah. And about a three-day journey, and he takes his son, which was not a baby, which was more so a teenager or a young man that could have whipped his father easily and said, no, you're not going to put me on that. I mean, Abraham's very old, and he could have said, you're not going to put me on the fire. But Isaac says, okay, I'll, whatever, whatever, whatever's going on here, Dad, I'll, I'll follow along with it. So he, he, he laid down. He let him, his dad tie him up. I mean, this isn't a kid letting a grown man time up or fighting. He's, he's like, I'm not, I know what you've heard, Dad. But the Bible says here that he received him back in a figure. In other words, the word parable is this. And we taught that whole lesson, which is a great, you can find it on our website. Abraham believed God and God had told him, in Isaac shall thy seed be. In other words, all nations all Hebrews will come through his seed. In other words, his physical body. He's going to have a wife. He's going to create. They're going to have children. He's taking a young man over there that does not have a wife and has not been promiscuous. There's no other women in the camp that's pregnant with his child. 
And he's going to lay him down on an altar and, and sacrifice him according to God's, and it was a burnt sacrifice. God get, told him to give him a burnt. Burnt meant he was not just going to kill him, he was going to burn him after he killed him. I mean, there's nothing but ashes. He's cremating the boy. But in his parabola, in his parable, he created, it was awesome teaching. You'll have to get it sometime. And I'm doing a little short uh, synopsis. But in his parabola, he created an image that even if this goes all the way, if this thing goes all the way to death and ashes, God will raise him up because I believe that God told me with all my heart that it's through this boy, this, through this boy that I'm going to have children, grandchildren. And so his willingness went all the way to Abraham raising the knife and, he's, and he stops because God says, Abraham, I know. I know now. We have to live in a place where that word figure, which is parabola, we're seeing in translucent kind of looking past and saying, I see the image of the burnt of, of fire, but I'm going through that because I'm attaining what God has called. We're going to attain what God has called us to attain. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Everybody still with me? I believe you are. Hallelujah. Let's keep going here. Keep going. So the question is, what is your parabola? What is your parable? What is your vision? Well, pastor, I, I just, God has called me to do this, that, and the other. I, I just believe uh, that I'm supposed to be, I believe I'm supposed to make millions, but I don't, I don't see it right now. Don't give up on it. Don't give up on that. Find the scriptures. I mean, if you're, if you're supposed to be a, a, a ministry of helps and make a lot for the kingdom, don't give up on it. I'm supposed to be in governments, Pastor. I'm supposed to help supply to this great machine, uh, you know, whatever's necessary, books, wisdom, help you with all this going forward. I, I don't see it all right now working in my life, but we're going to do this. I, and, and, and see, it's not just, it is, first and foremost, those 1 Corinthians 12, 28, Eight operations that you need to know where you stand in those what your spiritual call is but then all of the other things that he said in your blueprint because your children are your blueprint where you live and what you do is your blueprint he wants you to be very secure and not be like vagabonds going back and forth in the earth because you've got to get real secure where, where you're at, get real settled because you've got a place called prayer that you've got to stay in and you can't be moving and shifting and doing all this and stay in prayer because there's too many distractions in that. Glory be to God. Well, I'll, you know, it doesn't really... See, you, you, you guys are listening. That's why you're quiet. Um, and I really believe that. Uh, and I don't have a fear like... Well, it's like, and sometimes it gets quiet because things are kind of deep. But the thing about it is, you know me, and I know you, and I know those of, that are watching. We're certainly, and I don't say this mean, <laughs> and it's very contradictory to the way that most pastors work. I'm not after people. I love people, but we're all a call together for a revival. And this is all about his business going forward. And like I said, not everybody's called to revival. Not everybody's called to like, and I try to be real nice to people watching and people that come in. It's like, what are you about? We're about revival. We're about stuff that people don't really like to talk about, like praying, fasting, dying, dying to the flesh. But joy, my God, joy unspeakable, peace. See, I don't want nobody to be in the wrong class because sometimes, uh, one of the most embarrassing things ever, I don't know if you ever run to, I did it maybe a couple times in high school and a couple times in college. But you sit there on that first day and then the, they start, this is such and such class. And you go, my God, where's so and so? You know, you're three room, it's three rooms down. See, if you're not all about what we're doing, you're in the wrong class. And we don't want you to spend the next semester and not realize that you're in the wrong class. 
Well, I don't really, listen, you don't have to be one of the frontline fasters and prayers to come here. That's not what we're after. As long as you realize what we're about and don't try to talk us out of it. As long as you're quiet and just say, well, I'll just, I, I like to stick. If you just say, well, I'd like to stick around and see what you guys can do. That's good. As long as you don't realize that you're in some class like we're in a class. We're trying to, we're trying to get a bunch of people. We're not at <laughs> my disposition. The way I preach, I run more people off than I get. Yeah. I'm just amazed that anybody shows up. I appreciate it. Hallelujah. Who paid you to be here today? I don't know. Get rid of weights through the fire of purging. What weights? Time robbers? Thieves that steal your attention? Uh, it's time to put a spiritual chip on our shoulder. Now is a good time to get angry about same old. Same what? Same old. old. Uh, Gary talks about the greatest, the greatest challenge about going to conferences and then coming home is fighting the devil of same old. Just going right back to the same old, same old, same old. Just same old stuff. Never changing what you do spiritually to get to another place. <laughs> what, you've heard it so many times. The definition of insanity is to do the same thing every day over and over and expect different results. No, you'll never get different results. If you do the same thing, you say, well, I want to be this. Well, what are you going to change to ever be that? I'm just going to work harder. I'm going to do this. Well, no, you're just, it's the same old, same old. Hallelujah. But we must, we must direct our anger. It, we, this chip that I'm talking about on our spiritual shoulder, if you're mad, uh, then you're not willing. If you're spiritually mad, and if you've got an attitude, the, the title of this message was run with an attitude. If, you're, if you have a chip on your shoulder like, I am not willing to put up with a powerless uh, me anymore, then you're going someplace. But here's the thing. If your chip on your shoulder is diverted to somebody else, like we're not where we should be because pastor hadn't got us there yet or so-and-so's not doing their job or as long as it's somebody else <laughs> then you're already messed up if your attitude is like we're tired of this together and the first place it starts is with me then that's the right attitude um if you're if in your mind anyone holds the key other than yourself you're deceived so we've got to have the chip on our shoulder of the same old. Look at Acts 3. We've got just a few more minutes. Look at Acts 3 because I think this is an epitome of an example of uh, an attitude in the spirit that would not accept same old. Acts chapter 3. I'm going to turn there too because I've got it in my notes. But I think if I want to read it further... I don't know how many scripts. Yeah, let's, let's look at verse 1. Now let me tell you real quick. Pentecost, the day of Jesus is gone. Pentecost has happened. And it's just a day. It's just a week or so. It's just right after Pentecost. Okay, it's not long. I want to tell you. I don't. It's just right within days. There's already been 3,000 souls saved. The first on Pentecost, the day of Pentecost. You know when they spoke in the upper room, spoke in tongues. Peter preaches to them. And then... After that, there was 3,000 souls saved and baptized in water and baptized with the Holy Ghost all the same day. You can find that in Acts chapter 2. But then we find that right after this, Peter runs into a same old situation. But it's like, it's like the concept is, uh, it, once, when I read this, I pull out of it. One of the things I see out of this, it seems like, it's, it, it looks like, that there's an attitude here. Now, I can't tell you why, and we won't spend any time on it, how this guy that we're going to read about ever escaped Jesus. Because we know that Jesus went up to the temple uh, continually. 
And we know this by, I think it's the next chapter. This guy was over 40 years old, and he had been lame from birth. And we find that out in the first part of this. So I don't know, I'm not know, I do not know uh, the, the semantics of, or how that ever worked out where Jesus somehow didn't see him. The guy wasn't there that day or whatever, because I know Jesus would have healed him. But somehow he escaped it. But this guy had been around a long time. But let's look at verse 1. It says, And Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Now this is after they're, they're born again, spirit-filled. They're walking revivalists now. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seeing... Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask an alm. So he, 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 he approached them in the sense he's, he's crippled. He can't get up, but he asked, like, can you give me some money? And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the hand, right hand, get specific, and lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat at the alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Okay, we'll just stop right there. Okay, this guy had been there forever. He was an, inch, he was an ornament of same old. Nothing had ever changed. It's possible that Peter and John had seen him many times. Because he's there on a constant basis. Prior to their baptism, they may have walked by this guy. They, I, it's not there in words, but in my mind, I'm seeing this as one of those good kind of frustrations. Chip on your shoulder. Like, I'm, John, I'm sick of this. I'm absolutely, you know, without words, it was like, this has got to stop. So he goes over without conversation and, and the guy's talk, trying to get, you know, he's just used to getting money out of everybody. And he thought he could get money out of these apostles. See, you can get real preachy here and it really kind of deserves it. We said it a few, the modern day church at large, and I'm not th casting stones. I'm saying this is where we're all going. We've all got to get to this place where we're same old cannot stay. Because the modern day church would be like, you know what, let's, let's start a GoFundMe for this guy. Let's do something really wonderful for him. Us, our forte, I'm not saying don't ever do a GoFundMe, I don't, but our forte, our MO, we're not called for GoFundMes. We're called to go fast, go pray. And do what Peter and John said. I, it's not that the guys weren't broke. They, they, at the same time, there were a lot of money coming in. You'll see in the next few chapters, a lot of money coming in. They had plenty of money at that time to administrate because people were selling their land, bringing their money. Money was not the issue. They weren't broke because like we're impoverished. We don't have any money. They just didn't have money on them at the time. And they, and, but that, was the, that, that wasn't the matter. They weren't ready to start a GoFundMe. They were ready to say, I'm not here to give you something to pacify won't, what won't help you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up! Amen. Walk! Amen. That's what we're called to. Yes. That's the class you're in. Amen. Somebody said, well, that's not my class. Well, your class is down the hall. <laughs> Go find your class. And blessings on you. But this is our class. This is our class. And our class is not go fund you. Our, our class is go in to him for the purpose of revival. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. 
<laughs> we got we got to be the angry birds <laughs> against against not having miracles. Right. We really do. Attitude. Yeah. Hallelujah. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. Same old's got to die. Same old's got to die. Always, <laughs> always have far more than what you can stand. <laughs> always more, far more than what I can give. We got to just go to Joel. Just go to the book of Joel. See, Joel chapter 2. We cannot stand behind the, the cloak anonymity of, of uh, anything other than we're not there. We know how to get there. But we're not going to, we're not going to hide behind anything. Not even the good things that are being working in our life. In other words, we've got doctrine. And man, that's prime rib. Prime rib. But it's, we can't give the cheer like, you know, how'd they, you know, if you've ever been to a football game. We got, you know, we got spirit, yes we, we got doctrine, yes we do, we got doctrine, how about you, and then, you know. <laughs> I know, you got doctrine, yes you do, but where's the power? That's right. That's right. And we can hide behind, like, the greatest thing is just to be intimate with him. That's my heart, you're talking my heart now. The greatest thing is doctrine. You're talking my heart now. But you can say, as long as we have that, we got doctrine. Yes, we do. Yeah, but some of you are too young to, to even remember the Wendy's commercials. They were really cute. That old woman drive through, the drive through, get the hamburger, and she'd pull out. It, but it would be a competition of Wendy's because it would be a throw-off on the competition. She'd pull out and look at the, open the bun, and there'd be a little sliver of beef in there, and she goes, where's the beef? Where's the beef? We got doctrine, yes, we do, but where's the power? Come on, don't hide behind anything that we're strong on to say, we've kind of arrived. This is most important. I know it's most important, but where's the power? Go on in and get her done. Hallelujah. Stir it up. Jim Martin, I'm going to blame him. He said he was sick and tired of no power. And he was sick and tired of it in his people too. Look at uh, Joel chapter 2. And then we'll try to close with this. Although we've got more, but we're going to be good to you. Going to go send you home with a, a blessing for the Thanksgiving. See, the very flame, a flame, uh, Joel talks about a flame that will devour the stubble. And I never saw this until this morning when I was reading in Joel. But the very flame that purges us, it's also the same one that devours. It's a devouring force in the earth. So I saw that this morning. I said, my God, that's good. Look at, look at verse 1 of chapter 2. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Because you know Joel, of course, we've taught is that last day army. That's us. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess. And, and there again, I've told you this. This is not a depression. It's a ominous. He's talking about how ominously 
fear, you know, this is a fearful looking day, a, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the morning spreads upon the mountains, a great people and strong, there hath not been. I mean, this even supersedes the book of Acts because it says ever the like. Neither shall be any more after. This goes right up to the entire catching away of the saints or his coming back. Even to the years of many generations. Now look at this. A fire devoureth before them and behind them burneth. Why is the fire able to go in front of them and behind them? Because they've been through the fire. They are on fire. They've been through the purging. And so wherever they go and whatever they're doing, and a fire is going before them and it's devouring the land. And when it says that, what it's talking about is this great harvest of souls. We're bringing in this great harvest of souls and we're qualified to do it because we've walked into the fire and the fire is going in front of us and it's going behind us. A fire devoureth before them and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them and shall be Behind them as a desolate wilderness, yes or yea, and nothing shall escape them. Boy, I love that. All your family is going to be saved. Your friends that won't hear you now because, man, revival is an atmosphere. Anything that I've ever read on um, revivals, it is an atmosphere. It's like the atmosphere changes. You know, when uh, you got a low pressure, people say, my head hurts in a low pressure. I know because it's, it's heavy pressure. Clouds, and uh, there are certain cities in the United States that are highly uh, depressive because they never have sunshine, they never have high pressure. Suicide rates, uh, like in Seattle and different places, they're number one in the nation, different places. But I'm only using that as because, just as an illustration of the natural things. Then, then you, get a, uh, you get a high pressure comes through, and man, it just feels good. And, it, and, 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 the, and especially when the clouds lift and it gets colder because the clouds hold in the index. And so when the clouds lift, you get a, that cool front come through and everybody feels like, man, I feel spunky today. Yeah. Why? Because the high pressure... You know, it, it's, you, you've got less barometric pressure on you, and you've also got you know, the coolness of the Revival is like a, 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 an atmosphere. It's like a breath that comes in over a city. And what was like pulling teeth to get people to come to church. Then you got to have crowd control, and you got to have Marty and Rex and different ones standing at the door and saying, uh, we'll try to find a place for you. We're going to open the doors and let people hear, you know, out in the field. And we'll put a speaker in the field for a while if we need to until he gives us instruction to do what's next. But it's an atmosphere that comes in and everybody's like, this was the most unpopular party, but now it's real popular. Can we belong to it? Well, well I don't know. We'll, maybe we'll let you. <laughs> I don't know. We'll give, uh, let me think about it. Okay, okay. <laughs> you guys were... You guys were the dumps. Everybody, it was like, it's like a girl at school that like, you know, everybody thought she was ugly until, you know, somebody popular went with her and they're like, everybody wants to date her now. It's like she is so, well, nobody saw her beauty. They haven't seen our beauty yet. But we are going to be, and I say this in a very po powerful way, we're going to be the most, even in the natural, the most popular thing going because we're going to be helping people with an atmosphere like they've never seen before. Hallelujah. He says, the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, verse 4, and as a horseman, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the top of mountains, shall they leap like the noise of a flame. Here it goes, a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble. See, the stubble is going to, it's going to burn in front of us. Because it's burning in us right now. All that's good stuff. I think I'll close with that. It's going to burn in front of us because it's burning out of us right now. That was worth coming to church for right there. And I'm not going to take up another offering for that. 
Hallelujah. That's just freebie. That's a freebie. We might as, just a few more verses here. They'll run like mighty women. They'll, uh, or mighty women. Men and women. They will, yeah, amen. <laughs> they shall climb up the wall like men of war. They'll march every one on his way and they'll not break ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. And they shall walk every one in his path. They'll understand authority is what he's saying. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon the houses and they shall enter in at the windows like a thief. In other words, nothing shall escape us. You'll be getting people saved. You'll be making a deal, a financial deal. And in your deal, people want to, they'll, they'll say, somehow it'll come up in the conversation that they've been sick or somebody at home is sick or their wife, you know, you're a businessman, they're a businessman or businesswoman, you're a businesswoman and then you're working a deal and uh, you're buying something from them, they're buying something for you or something from you or whatever or something's happening financially and something how, somehow it's going to come up and they're really sick, you know, they got, they're dying of cancer or this, that and the other and you're going to say, well, you know, is it possible? That I can pray for this person. Yeah, 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 you can pray. No, I mean, can I come over to your house? Can I come inside? Well, sure, you can. And in the middle of all this, Joel's army is going to climb that you're going into their, you're climbing through their windows. You're going into their homes. Nothing's going to escape us. We're going in there. And as Jesus walked over to, uh, to Peter's mother-in-law and just touched her or just said, you know, just that's it. You won't have to go in there like we're going in there and setting up camp and we're going to pray for hours. You're going to go in there and just sometimes, you know, the word sometimes it doesn't even say that he even said anything. It just touched him. I'll see you tomorrow. Didn't we have a nine o'clock appointment? Yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. And, and then she's, she's like starting to cry. God, I can see this miracles that you're going to do the miracles that I'm going to do and this outpouring is in front of us let's let the fire burn in us now let it strip us of anything and all distractions if there's any play church in you whatever play church is in you beg to God beg to God that he pulls that out of you beg to God please God pull play church out of me Get it out of me because you're going to walk into homes, men that were mean men, mean men, when they see their children healed through your hands. It's going to change their whole disposition. When their wives that were on so many antidepressants that they couldn't even leave them alone because they were scared they were going to commit suicide. They've been in and out of counseling centers. You're going to go in there and just in a touch, those spirits of torment are going to leave their bodies. And with no fanfare, you'll walk out. You'll say, I'll see you tomorrow for lunch. Tomorrow's the signing, I think, of that deal. Yeah, yeah, okay. And you're going to get a call in the night. What, what did you do to my wife? What happened? I don't, we did, I didn't do anything. We just prayed like I told you we're going to pray. The power came. Can I, can, can I know you're Jesus? Well, sure. Sure. It's real easy. See, the door-to-door -door knocking and the passing out, you will read this, a bunch of foolishness there's no power in that but the wor the world will respond to Joel's army because we've got something to offer them we've got an absolute power to offer them hallelujah let's all stand hallelujah